This is the festival or the feast of the Transfiguration. It's a day when we acknowledge the glory of God. And that theme is expressed in all of our lessons for today. It's the beginning of Lent in just a couple of days. And so we prepare ourselves to fix our vision on the glorious Christ, who was not just man, but God as well. That first lesson we have is from the second book of Kings, and it describes heaven as the final destination for God's people. For some it's a place, for others it's a state of being, but one thing we know for sure, heaven is a place where you get to spend time and eternity with God. From the second book of Kings, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, and if we talk about transition stories, this is probably the greatest transition story ever written. Chief, I read this passage one time at a change of command ceremony. And the old CO was escorted out in a flaming red convertible. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here. For the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went, and stood at some distance from them, as they were both standing by the Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed, on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken away from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. Here is our first lesson. Depending on your relationship with your boss, being told the boss wants to see you could elicit any number of responses from you. It could be you're getting a raise, it could be you're being let go. I know when I get a phone call that says the principal wants to see you, I immediately flash back to my days as a student and think, <laughs> oh no. What did I do now? <laughs> I never think to myself, oh, I'm going to get an award. Oh, yeah. somebody called to compliment me. <laughs> the writer of Psalm 50 talks about that and announces how God makes contact with each of us. Please turn to page 238 in the front of the hymnals, and we will read Psalm 50 in unison. Page 238, Psalm 50. 
verses 1 through 6. The Lord, the God of gods, has spoken. He has called the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in its beauty, God reveals himself in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silence. Before him there is a consuming flame, and round about him a raging storm. He calls the heavens and the earth from above to witness the judgment of his people. Gather before me my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. Let the heavens declare the rightness of his cause, for God himself is judge. In our New Testament lesson, we have portions of another letter that St. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, and some interesting <coughs> illustrations are used here. He talks about our gospel being veiled, and I know from when I was a child, there were women who would come to church and wore a veil over their faces because they felt it was proper. When I conduct wedding ceremonies, one of the items we have to resolve is whether or not the bride is going to wear a veil. And if so, who gets to lift it? The father or the groom? And I know that in Islamic culture, for a sense of propriety, women veil their faces. I remember being in the mosque years ago talking to one of the merchants and he was explaining to me how Muslim men can have up to four wives. But the trick is you have to treat each wife equally. So if you buy a gold ring for one, you must buy four gold rings. <laughs> and he laughed at me and he said, you Americans, you have no idea what romance and marriage is all about. You think it's all matters of the heart, where in my country, it's simply an arrangement between two fathers. Divorce is very simple in the Islamic culture. If a man wants to divorce his wife, he steps outside on the front porch and announces to witnesses three times, I divorce you. And that's it. It's done. There's no division of property. There's no child custody arrangements. She gets as much as she can carry and all the gold he gave her. So I asked Ahmad one day, what if you marry wife number three or wife number four, and after the ceremony, she removes that veil and you're like, ew, ew, ew. is it like divorce, divorce, divorce? And he said, no, because the dowry is usually like a million dollars. You pay the father 10%. The balance is due if you divorce his daughter. <coughs> so as a result, it's a pretty painful process to divorce a woman. Okay. Paul talks about us being veiled and God's message being veiled. From Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Here ends our second lesson. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, our gospel lesson is the story of the transfiguration, where Jesus takes three of his trusted followers with him, and suddenly he is revealed to them for who he really is. Not just their friend, not just the carpenter from Nazareth, but as the Son of God. This is the Gospel according to Mark, the ninth chapter, beginning at the second verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John 
and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my Son, the Beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the kids come on up.